In this episode, I speak with international raw food chef, instructor, and author, Crystal Bonnet. Key points addressed were Crystal's training as a raw food chef and how her work seeks to incorporate aspects she found missing in her own culinary education as she works with raw food development and businesses that deal with raw foods. We also discussed both of her eBooks as well as her in-depth online raw desserts course. Please stay tuned for my fascinating talk with Crystal Bonnet. Hi, I'm Patricia, and this is Investigating Vegan Life with Patricia Kathleen. This series features interviews and conversations I conduct with experts from food and fashion to tech and agriculture, from medicine and science to health and humanitarian arenas. Our inquiry is an effort to examine the variety of industries and lifestyle tenants in the world of vegan life. To that end, we will cover topics that have revealed themselves as common and integral when exploring veganism. The dialogue captured here is part of our ongoing effort to host transparent and honest rhetoric for those of you who, like myself, find great value in hearing the expertise and opinions of individuals who have dedicated their work and lives to their ideals. You can find information about myself and my podcast at patriciakathleen.com. Welcome to Investigating Vegan Life. Now let's start the conversation. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I am your host, Patricia, and today I am excited to be sitting down with Crystal Bonnet. Crystal is an international raw food chef, instructor, and author. You can find out more about everything we talk about today with her on her website, www.crystaldawnculinary.com. That is C-R-Y-S-T-A-L-D-A-W-N-C-U-L-I-N-A-R-Y.com. Welcome, Crystal. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm excited to climb through everything that you're doing and um, all of your endeavors. For everyone who might be new to this podcast, I will give a quick bio on Crystal before I start peppering her with questions. Prior to doing that, I will offer you a quick roadmap of today's podcast so you can follow the line of our trajectory of inquiry. Um, we will first be looking at asking Crystal to unpack her personal and history with um, cooking and vegan or a plant-based cooking and, and a lot of those things. Then we'll look at unpacking terms that Crystal has. These are terms that a lot of people find wrote that I find change a lot within the plant-based and vegan communities, namely just to look at things like how she defines veganism, plant-based, those types of things so that we're all on the same page. Then I'll look at unpacking um, Crystal's uh, website where she offers her courses, um, she talks about recipes and blogs, all of the services that she offers and how some of those things have been curated and how she's come at those kind of uniquely under the guise of her own um, repertoire. Then I'll wrap everything up with um, our rapid fire questions in which we take questions that have been written in from you, our audience, and um, people have asked us to ask experts in Crystal's line of work, um, culinary and other. So as promised, before I start asking her a bunch of our questions, um, a quick bio on Crystal. Crystal Bonnet is an international raw food chef, instructor, and cookbook author. Her culinary passion started with living plant-based food in her own kitchen, which led to training at industry-leading uh, industry culinary schools, Plant Lab, formerly Matthew Kenny, and Pure Joy Academy. Also a graduate of plant-based and raw food nutrition programs, she's known, um, she knows the importance of teaching not only the culinary aspect but also nutrition of living foods. Crystal believes her students should be given as much knowledge as necessary to gain a full understanding of raw foods and their health benefits. And Crystal's extensive knowledge of the plant-based culinary industry has led her to develop unique plant-based menus for new restaurants, catered multiple health retreats within the Canada and Europe, and started her own professional raw chocolate and dessert business. Um, she believes everyone should have the knowledge and skills to incorporate healthy food alternatives into their lifestyle. Her greatest reward is seeing the positive impact this uh, can have on others, which is why she created Crystal Dawn Culinary. So Crystal, I really want to climb into everything that you're doing. I want to get into your chocolate and dessert business, as well as the catering, and also, of course, the courses and the books that you have online. But before we get to that, I'm hoping you can kind of draw a better narrative to develop a stage-like platform for all of our audience members listening as to how you kind of came into your training and, um, and what launched you into your culinary plant-based career that you have now. Sure, so that could be a long answer. <laughs> I'll try to keep it short though. Um, so 
my diet journey has been a very long progressive one it wasn't an overnight you know i didn't just wake up one day and decide i want to become plant-based i don't want to eat anymore it's been progressive since i was five years old all the way up until i was 32. so during that time i had stopped in my younger years i had stopped eating meat red meat and then i was just eating white meat up until my early 20s I, the reason why is because I could never, at a really young age, I didn't understand the concept of eating why we ate dead animals. It didn't make any sense to me. And at that time, at five years old, I mean, you don't really think about the ethical aspect or the environmental aspect or the health benefits. It just, something had clicked with me that it just didn't make sense. And so I had stopped eating red meat at a very young age. And then in my early 20s, for health reasons, I had cut out gluten out of my diet and dairy. And then about 10 years later, I decided to, oh, so then at that time, I was what you call a pescatarian. So I had already stopped eating white meat. So I was eating fish and eggs and, you know, some seafood. And then I was getting sick all the time. I was having a lot of um, health problems. I had moved to a, I don't know if you know where Edmonton, Alberta is in Canada. It's really far north and it's really dry. And when I had moved there, I had started having health problems, but it was because I was eating a lot of processed gluten-free foods. And this is the thing, you know, when it says vegan gluten-free on it, it doesn't mean that it's healthy. You could be eating processed foods without the micronutrients that your body needs to heal to regenerate your cells. If you're not getting the proper fruits and vegetables or enough fruits and vegetables, then of course your health is going to decline. So I was eating, you know, packaged oatmeal for breakfast and I was eating gluten-free frozen vegan burritos in the microwave for lunch. And then I would go home and I would make scrambled eggs and and gluten-free waffles. And that was basically my diet for probably about four or five years. So of course, at that time, my health had just started to kind of deteriorate and my immune system was going down. I was getting sick all the time. I was working in an office of over 400 people. I was catching everything. And so that's when I had decided and I knew my body was speaking to me. I'm like, something is wrong. I shouldn't be getting sick like this all the time. What am I doing wrong? What do I need to change? So I started, I've always been really interested in health and like detox and cleansing and just, um, you know, increasing your vitality. So I started doing a lot of research online and I was looking at certain cleanses and detoxes and I just came across raw food. Mm. Now keep in mind, I had never, I was never into cooking before I had discovered raw food. Uh, it, it, that's why I was eating so much processed microwave food. I had never had any culinary training before I got into raw food. If I had to cut up an apple, it was like the end of the world for me. I just like, I just didn't want to be in the kitchen preparing food. Yeah. So I came across a raw food de detox plan. It was like a 21 day raw food cleanse. It was basically a raw food meal plan. And when I had found it and I had was reading all the health benefits about, you know, living fruits and vegetables, living foods, I knew right then and there, I, I knew that was what I had to do. I knew that that was what my body was missing. I downloaded the meal plan. I was so committed when I bought all the equipment, you know, spent the $500 on the Vitamix. I spent so much money on all of the ingredients and supplements I needed and yeah, I stuck to it. I did the full 21 days. And after that, my life completely changed. I could never go back to eating seafood and eggs because my palate had totally changed. Um, what, what I craved totally changed. I was craving green smoothies. I wanted like these healthy living foods. And I felt so amazing. And I loved creating raw foods. And I had realized at that point, the reason why I had loved creating raw food is because it looks just so much better than cooked food, aesthetically speaking, because it's so vibrant. You still have all the colors, you know, it hasn't been cooked, so it's not dead. It just, I think just like looking at raw food, it just makes you even feel better, you know, seeing the greens and the colors and, you know, it's just so hydrating for your body. And I just fell in love with making raw food. So then that's when I had decided that I wanted to start taking courses and really diving into it more. 
And I took my very first course in 2015. It was a Matthew Kinney course when they were offering that online. It was a fundamentals of raw food course. Um, it was a full-time, very intense course. Um, and that was a month straight. I had graduated that. And then I had started a food blog and started developing my own recipes because I'd be bringing in food to work. I was working in an office. I'd be bringing in all my food for everyone to try and everyone would absolutely love it. And they're like, oh, you should start a food blog, you know, start documenting your recipes. And then it just, everything spiraled from there. I started taking more courses, got really into chocolate and desserts because I have a strong sweet tooth. I love desserts, but I had never liked the traditional desserts because they were always full of dairy and gluten. And so I took a professional raw chocolate course and um, that's when I had started my farmer's market business in Edmonton. And I did that for a couple of years. I made professionally stone ground raw chocolate and some like energy bites and snacks, sprouted buckwheat granola. And then I really got into teaching. Teaching just kind of fell in my lap because I would have a lot of people come to the market and ask me to learn how to do raw food and how to do what I was doing. And so I started doing some classes and then realized that teaching was what I ultimately wanted to do. That's where my passion really lied. And um, everything just spiraled from there. I took more and more courses. I was getting more opportunities, more jobs. And then I decided to launch my online teaching business a year ago, actually. I, it was just my one year anniversary of launching Crystal Dawn Culinary in my online raw desserts course. Excellent. So yeah, so that was just a year ago and I've been really busy with that and just growing my business and getting the word out there and, and loving it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, congratulations on the year anniversary that the first year they say makes or breaks you. It sounds like yours has made you. Yes. I want to get into, so I want to kind of parse out the raw um, kingdom, which for me has changed just as significantly um, as, as kind of the, the vegan universe and it's like awareness. I remember the first raw food restaurant in, um, like NorCal where I was living at the time. It was kind of this experimental and you know, it, was, it was no more than maybe 13 years ago. And since then, I think there's been like an awakening with the, the raw food concept. But before we unpack terms about you know, vegan or, or plant-based or any of those, can you kind of help everyone who's listening define what is a raw food? What are the parameters about how high you can cook it and things like that that really determine what the raw food emphasis is? Okay, no problem. Yeah, so raw food is basically living foods, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, sprouted grains that haven't been heated over 46 to 48 degrees Celsius. I don't know, I think that's 115 Fahrenheit for you guys, but so yeah, anything, but there's a lot of methods that you can do to warm up or have that cooked texture, like dehydrating. So you can dehydrate, you can even sous vide vegetables or fruits, um, below the 40, below 48 degrees Celsius. Same with chocolate. So anything that hasn't been heated above that temperature, because there's been a lot of studies done that anything over and above that temperature, it starts to degrade the living enzymes and nutrients. And um, so that's what you're trying to do. You're not trying to cook everything out. We want to eat everything. Because when we eat living foods, we're also eating the digestive enzymes. And this is what a lot of people don't understand is when they're starting to transition from cooked food to raw food, if you've been eating so much cooked food your whole life, your body is really depleted of those enzymes that you need to digest the food because you haven't been eating the living enzymes to be able to replenish that in your body. So when you start eating these living foods and you don't have the digestive enzymes to break it down, it can cause digestive upset or bloating. And then that's when a lot of people get scared and worried and they're like, oh, that raw food is not for me. But so I always recommend that people take digestive enzymes for the first six months to replenish. And then as your body gets used to it, you realize that you don't need it anymore because you're eating these living foods. You've got the living enzymes, the nutrients, so much more hydration, all the water content in the fruits and vegetables and yeah, it's just so much better for your body. So how do you define um, plant-based foods? Is it anything that's coming from a plant? Or, I mean, you, you just recently talked, you know, in your talking about your history, you talked about being, you know, kind of this packaged food, plant-based vegan who was eating like a whole bunch of preservative laden foods. So how would you define eating whole plant-based food? Is it just eating plants or how, what are like the parameters around that? 
So for everybody, you know, this is a really hot topic, this plant-based versus vegan lately. And so I can see why you're asking about this. And so everybody has their own definition on plant-based and vegan. Um, and everyone's going to tell you something different. So my, a lot of people believe that plant-based is eating a high plant diet, but still eating some animal foods and eggs a few times a week. I disagree with that. When you, if you say that you're plant-based, it means that the base of your food is you're eating plants and eggs don't come from plants. Animal products don't come from plants. So I like to use the term plant-based because I feel like vegan has a little bit of a negative connotation around it, especially with um, a lot of like the vegan act activism. And so I don't like to use the term vegan. And also I believe that when you say you're vegan, you're living a fully 100% vegan lifestyle where, you do, where you've eliminated all animal products, not just in your diet, but in your home and your cleaning products, your skincare products, your car, you know, no car, no leather seats in your car, no leather clothing at all. So to me, that's what I define as vegan. And so, which is why I like to use the term plant-based because I just feel like it's a lot friendlier um, and it's just a lot less scary than using the, the word vegan. So that's, I call myself plant-based because I mean, I eat a plant-based diet. I don't eat animal products. Um, and yeah, that's my, that's my feeling on, on plant-based and vegan. Okay. And conversely, kind of the same issue in the raw kingdom, which um, I've come across some people. I had always thought initially that raw just inherently meant vegan, you know, that it was fruits and vegetables, but I came across some, some raw food advocates that were eating raw meats, ceviches and, um, and things of that nature and still calling themselves raw because they weren't heating the food up. Would you consider that to be a raw food um, person, someone who's consuming meat and fish, eating it undercooked? No. So I've actually never heard of that, someone calling themselves a raw foodist eating raw fish and raw meat on top of raw fruits and vegetables and grains and nuts and seeds. If you even, I'm sure if you look at, and all the courses that I've taken, um, everything that's taught in raw food, it's taught as raw living plant-based foods in the forms of fruits, nuts, seeds, uh, sprouted legumes, sprouted grains. Yeah. So I've never, I've never heard of, I wouldn't consider that as a, a raw food diet, but I mean, again, everybody has their own <laughs> opinion, I guess. Anyone, right. The exception out there. I wanted to make sure we clarified that. I yeah. A lot of raw food experts would say that. Um, and so I think those fringe people kind of need to be called out and maybe just, um, come up with a different name. Um, yeah. Wondering again, before I climb into your current endeavors, I do just want to get some of these hot topics off of the air. Raw food um, chefs have been accused of using nuts really heavily and excluding people who are um, not accused, but assigned this idea that they're nut heavy. And so people who have nut allergies could not um, necessarily become raw food um, practitioners. And I'm wondering if you agree with that or if you feel like anyone can kind of adapt to anything and if you yourself and your endeavors have taken that kind of, uh, uh, people can be allergic to anything, you know, but nut allergies certainly have seen a, a, a very uh, sharp increase over the past decade. Have you looked at that or um, ever had that conversation with your colleagues? Yeah, so I mean, that is a big topic and a big conversation around raw food, and especially people who are immersed in it. Um, I try to come up with a lot of nut free recipes. Actually, the I just we had just launched with some of my colleagues a seven day seven chefs raw food meal plan in May. And for my day, so we had seven chefs each come up with recipes for one day. Um, five recipes in a day and all my recipes were actually nut free. Um, so it, it totally depends on the chef and the person. I mean, uh, of course, there's a lot of nuts being used in raw food, but you don't have to use a lot of nuts. There are a lot of alternatives. I mean, sunflower seeds, you can achieve a really creamy consistency with sunflower seeds, the same as cashews. So like I make a lot of sunflower seed sauces, cheeses, same with hemp seeds will also give a really creamy consistency. You don't have to rely on cashews either. 
Um, so it really depends on the person, I guess, how much knowledge you have to be able to substitute ingredients where you don't have to use a lot of nuts. I mean, there's also a lot of raw foodists that rely heavily on oils and some raw foodists that don't. Um, so again, it's it, just their preference, their knowledge, what they've been taught, what they can do, uh, what they believe. Um, but there's definitely a lot of substitute. You don't, it doesn't have to be super nut heavy. There's, you can use Irish moss paste to replace nuts, which is a vegan gelatin alternative, which is a natural seaweed. Um, yeah, there's a lot of options and alternatives. So, and also I wanted to clarify that as far as utility and utensils and carrying vessels, like oils and things of that nature, can you be a raw foodist even incorporating things that were in there to extract them heated up to a certain degree, or does it always have to include the entire process as well, um, abiding by those guidelines? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I talk about this a lot, actually, because um, in a lot of raw food recipes, there are still some ingredients used that are not 100% raw. For instance, a lot of people rely heavily on agave and maple syrup. Those are not raw at all. Right. And they're heated to such a high temperature for it to be processed. Coconut sugar is, of course, not raw because it's heated to get it to be crystallized to, to produce coconut sugar. So to me, again, like everybody has their own definition or term of what raw can be. For me, it is living whole plant-based foods in their most purest form in the healthiest way possible that you can consume them. Um, for example, Irish moss paste, I was just mentioning that because that's a really good substitute for nuts. It, that's You have to incorporate hot water in order to activate the component in it that makes it a gelatin that activates the setting agent. So if you're using agar, Irish moss, you have to use hot water, so it has to be heated. Cacao, this is a really um, controversial topic as well because cacao, cacao, the difference between cacao and cocoa, cacao means unroasted, cocoa is roasted. So if you're buying unroasted, it's still a lot healthier, you're still getting a lot more of the health benefits as opposed to eating cocoa. But during the process of processing cacao products and during the fermentation process, it, it is heated way over and above the 48 degrees Celsius limit. Um, there's very few truly raw cacao products that you can actually buy that have been cold pressed. I haven't gotten, been able to get my hands on any of them here in Canada. Um, but I mean, again, it's all about education and people being able to make up their own minds about ingredients and this is what i really teach in my course and what i really teach in my classes because i like to tell people where the ingredients are coming from how they're processed cashews it's really hard to get truly raw cashews cashews are heated at a really high temperature to be able to remove the shell and cashews again is one of those ingredients that are really controversial because they're not a very sustainable um i wouldn't even call they're not a nut they're actually a seed that comes from a cashew apple and so you can think about how many apples, cashew apples would need to be destroyed to get one pound of cashews even because you need one apple to get one seed from it. Um, and then they're coated with the same resin, the same toxin that's on poison ivy. So a lot of these workers and farmers that are um, farming these cashew seeds, they're getting all of these burns, they're getting a lot of skin issues. Um, and you have to heat the shell at a really high temperature to remove that toxin to be able to open them. And you can get truly raw cashews and ones that are, you know, more sustainably and, and humanely grown and harvested. Um, but again, they're a lot more expensive, they're hard to come by. So again, I just really like to educate people on those topics. So again, they can make up their own mind and try to source ingredients from um, a better source that they feel comfortable with. Yeah, and cashews are an interesting one because um, I think they've they've always been around and you know considered like the fancy nut or whatever. But I think that the the heavy um, relying on them in the especially in the vegan community has kind of opened up a lot of the backstory that you're talking about, which I found um, unbelievable. You know, as far as a, a, a harvesting other nuts, like the amount of labor and potential abuse of humans and and food alike that can happen with it. 
I think it's precarious. And so to have all of these like cashew nut based ice creams and butters and like just everything that everyone's relying on in those communities can be, um, it could be seen as, as questionable, you know, going the route of like quinoa and things like that, where we need to start questioning that area. I do want to just kind of, you just dropped a breadcrumb that I quickly want to grab um, about the cacao versus cocoa because you have a chocolate um, industry. And I do want to get to your online work first and things like that. But how have you personally solved that within your chocolate and dessert um, endeavors? This this idea of heating it up too high with cacao versus cocoa, what, what have you landed with? Um, well, I just make sure that I source. So during the process when you're actually working with the cacao products and making chocolate chocolate at home it doesn't go over and above the 48 degrees celsius but it does during the processing so before you get the products in hand it's already gone through a process that's been heated above that but you can see the difference if you look at cocoa butter or even taste cocoa butter as opposed to cacao butter and the same with powder they're completely different. Cocoa butter is really dark and really, really bitter. And cacao, because it's been roasted and heated so high. And cacao powder is a lot lighter and it's actually sweeter in taste. And I actually prefer it a lot better. And I find too that when I eat cacao, it doesn't give me this um, really strong high that the roasted cocoa does. Mm. Again, because there's still a lot more mineral and nutrient content in cacao versus cocoa. Um, so, I mean, I just make sure that I source a brand that I know is coming from a, you know, fair trade, sustainable farm, eco-friendly farm. Um, and that is just a really good product, but I'm going into it knowing that it's probably not a hundred percent raw. And, and I'm okay with that because at the end of the day, I would rather eat homemade chocolate from cacao than going and buying a dark chocolate bar from the store that, you know, has soy lecithin and a bunch of added other sugars that I don't want to eat and other ingredients. So, right. Yeah. I'm wondering with your online courses, if we can kind of pivot towards that, I, I'd love to know how you've curated them, like how you've decided to go about, there's a myriad of ways when you get into, um, you know, um, pedagogical lenses as to how to look at knowledge in general, let alone food and the culinary world. So can you tell us a little bit about how you've developed and curated them and who they're designed for? Sure. So right now I offer my one online raw dessert chef certification course. So I have my one main course and I designed it um, last year. It was a, about a year and a half in development, but I wanted to create an online course because I knew at that time that it would be a good business venture to go into, but also I wanted to reach a wider audience than just doing live classes at home um, or live classes wherever I was teaching them. So I decided to create something based on what, I would want as a consumer and what I would want in a course because all of my culinary training and everything that I had done up to that point had been online. I had never taken in-person training actually until last year. And so I knew a lot about online culinary courses. I knew what I didn't want. I knew what I would want in a course. Um, and so I started with that aspect. I went into it kind of knowing exactly what I would want as a customer, what I didn't want. And then I chose raw desserts because that was at my, at the time, like just really my passion and where I really excelled. And again, I mean, I, I love chocolate and sweets and desserts. And I also too, I feel like the desserts are a good segue and a good transition food for people wanting to try plant-based food because I mean, most people love chocolate and desserts, right? Most people love sweets, especially just for the eye and for aesthetic purposes. If you go into a bakery or into a cafe, you're always drawn to the dessert case and you're always looking at, at the desserts and the pastries. And um, so I just feel like it's a really good transition food. It's really easy to replace the dairy and the gluten and the sugar with more natural ingredients. Um, yeah, so going into the process of creating the outline of my course again, I just wanted to include things that 
I wanted as a customer. You know, there were some courses that I had taken where there was a lot of information missing that I wish that I had known, you know, things like, well, okay, that's great that I'm learning this recipe, but why are you using these ingredients in this recipe? First, you need to learn about all of the ingredients to get a good understanding of why you're using them before you even start learning the recipes. And then there was a lot of courses I had taken that they would finish the recipe, but then, okay, but how can I plate that and serve that? How can I make it look pretty if I want to serve it at a dinner party, if I want to serve it in a cafe? Um, so I wanted to incorporate everything like from the beginning right to the end. And then also I include a large business aspect because a lot of people who take the course are a lot of culinary entrepreneurs who already have bakeries who want to include more allergy friendly desserts in their repertoire on their menu um, a lot of people who want to start their own raw desserts business so that's why i wanted to incorporate a lot of that as well because when people take the course i want them to be able to know how to make an income okay i have this training now that's excellent but now what do i do with it and that's what was missing in a lot of the training that i had taken in uh, all my culinary online courses is, okay, that's great to have this training, but now how do I make money? So I teach the students on how to write a proper professional recipe. They have to come up with their own raw dessert menu. And then they have that their own recipes. They could sell them. They could create an ebook. I teach them how to create an ebook, how to sell an ebook, um, how to do recipe costing. Actually, tomorrow we're doing a whole recipe costing lesson with a a good friend of mine who's a culinary instructor who teaches this curriculum professionally and so we're going to teach the students on how to um, effectively cost your recipes to maximize your profit how to scale up like what's the best way to do wholesale um, yeah so that's kind of how and it's always growing I'm constantly adding content um, I do live teaching components every month. And so even if, when students come to me and they say, ha, say, hey, Crystal, how do you do this? Or I want to learn this. I'll be like, hey, that's a good um, lesson to add into the program. So it's constantly evolving. I just want to make it, you know, the best it can be for everyone in the program or who are interested in taking it. Yeah, it sounds like the complete package. I love that addition in the very end to, you know, really getting through to, plating it and then curation and then the business aspect. I think you're right. And really knowing and listening to your audience is key for every endeavor. It sounds like that's a really good clue as to why you're doing so well. I'm curious, um, how much is it? How long is the course? Like, can you tell anyone like a little bit about like what they can expect? Sure. So it's lifetime access, go at your own pace. And I did that because when I had taken my first culinary course, which was a one month full-time course and it had a deadline i had to quit my full-time job and get a part-time job just so i could take this online course at that time because it was full-time eight hours a day and there was no way at that time that i could do both i know a lot of people did but, and hats off to them but um that's kind of what i decided to do so i didn't want people to go into the program being stressed out with the deadlines and knowing that everybody has really busy lives they have families and um, so I wanted people to go into it, you know, just like relax. Okay, I have time to work on it whenever I have time. So as soon as you register for the program, you have access to the program in, in its entirety and you have lifetime access. So you even have access to all the brand new content that's added, all the brand new live teaching components. And um, it takes students. I just had a student actually finish in record time because she worked on it so much. She worked really hard on the course and she finished it in three months. And then I have students that takes average eight to 10 months. So again, it's, it all depends on how much work you put into it, how many lessons you do a week. Um, yes, yeah, so you can get it done in as little time as possible. Nice. Yeah. You have some eBooks you've written as well. Do these correspond with the courses, the information that you've put out, or are they completely separate? And what are the name of the books? Okay, so I have, yeah, I have a couple of ebooks. So I have um, Beginner to Raw Food Res Beginner to Advanced Raw Food Recipes, which was my very first ebook that I had done in 2017. And that is just a pretty basic recipe book with recipes, um, everything from elixirs, smoothies, up to chocolate and some, you know, main courses. Um, and that's just really designed for people to get a taste of raw food and 
what you can do with raw food, the techniques you can do. And then I have another ebook called Sweets, um, Sweets, Chocolate and Treats, <laughs> I believe. And so that's my raw dessert ebook. And so that's a good segue into the program because that gives people a really good idea of what I do teach knowing how to work with the ingredients, what ingredients to use in raw desserts, and has, you know, really similar recipes to what I teach in the online program. Nice. It sounds like it's an incredible accompaniment. Um, do And all of these are accessible online, right? Your students and everyone who wants to, your prospective clients can go and to your website and check everything out. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I have a shop page on my website and you can find my ebooks there as well as the seven days, seven chefs meal plan that I collaborated with uh, these other seven chefs, which is great. It's an, because I mean, learning from, I believe that you can learn more from different people because everyone has their own style. So it was a really great collaboration. It's a lot of really good information and recipes. Absolutely. Well, we're going to turn now to our rapid fire questions because we're kind of closing in on time. Um, and we have a bunch of people that really got excited about, um, you know, the prospect of my speaking to a, a raw food chef. I think it's, um, you guys are a little bit more unicorns than the vegan people that we've spoken to for this series. And I want to dive right in. Uh, we had a lot of people ask about what are the top misconceptions about raw food living um, that you run into or that you can kind of dispel right away? Do you have like a top three that you hear all the time that you're like, no, 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 that's not the case? Yeah, so that we love off salad. <laughs> and I'll tell you right now, if I just ate salad, I would die. <laughs> because I'm a comfort food person. I need my snacks. I need satiated foods. Um, so the biggest misconception definitely is that we just don't eat raw fruits and vegetables. There's so many different techniques and textures that you can create with raw food. Um, you can do raw food, corn, raw corn chips in the dehydrator, like raw pizza. Um, I mean, almost anything you can develop and make raw. So, yeah, I think that's the number one biggest misconception. Definitely, the raw food. You know, it can be really satiating, really filling, really good, really tastes good, but really nutritious at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had a lot of people kind of going off your last one. Um, we had a ton of people ask about products. Do you have a specific dehydrator you like? Do you have also a list of like your top five things when you're getting into eating raw, like a dehydrator or something that you would really recommend people go out and get just to make that time easier? Yes, for sure. So the number one equipment when you're getting into raw food that I always recommend is a good high-speed blender because with your blender, you're gonna be able to do so many different things, make sauces, dressings, you can use it as a food processor. And for a high-speed blender, I always recommend the Vitamix. Um, there's also Blendtec Omni Blend that are really good high-speed blenders as well. I've used the Blendtec, but I still am like, the Vitamix is my number one blender for sure. And then um, certain tools, like you don't always have to get a dehydrator right off the bat. But that's kind of like the last thing I recommend. So then I would recommend like a spiralizer. So, which is, you know, a really good tool to use to make vegetable noodles and just do different textures of food. Um, a really good knife because also too, when you're cutting like say watermelon or a lot of these fruits and vegetables, you do need a really good sharp chef knife to be able to cut them properly. But also like what I was saying to create textures and create like different shapes in your food so that your, your salads or whatever you're eating is not boring. Um, a good food processor. Well, I shouldn't say it doesn't have to be a real, I started off with a $50 food processor on Amazon and it lasted me four years before I finally bought a professional one. And a food processor is really good because you can make your own nut butters, you can do your own energy bites, energy bars, like your pie crust, doughs. You can shred all your vegetables and prep all your vegetables for the week. Um, and then fifth one, uh, a good, oh, you can, like another tool is a mandolin slicer, which is, you know, a mandolin you can use to thin, thinly slice vegetables or fruits. And then definitely like the dehydrator is the last thing that I would recommend because dehydrators, I would definitely recommend a good one, which is, I love using the Excalibur because it has the large square trays. They have a 10 year warranty. They're just really easy to use, but they are a little bit expensive. So 
Um, but they're great to have. Like if you're a comfort food person like me, then when you're getting into raw food, definitely get it to high. Or if you live in a really cold climate, because it's a really great way to warm up your food as well. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had people write in asking what your top pieces of advice are for someone just getting into raw food. So I don't know if it goes along with these utensils that are um, these uh, cooking machines that you've just mentioned, or do you have like other key pieces of advice that you tell someone who's just kind of looking to getting into that lifestyle of eating? Yes. So start slow. Don't go cold turkey overnight. You want to slowly transition also too, because for someone who's been eating, if you're coming off a standard American diet and you decide you want to go into raw food, you're going to have a lot of detox symptoms. And again, you're going to get, um, you're going to get negative feelings about it. And then you're probably going to transition back to your old diet. So you want to start slow, start taking out maybe a couple things a week, like first remove dairy, then you can remove meat, you know, then you can remove gluten, um, start slow with maybe having a green smoothie in the morning, um, maybe start incorporating raw vegetables into your cooked meals, like kind of a raw cooked fusion, and just go slow from there. And then you will slowly gradually transition into um, if you want to do 100% raw. I myself, I don't eat 100% raw. But for me, cooking is very basic. So cooking would include steaming or using my rice cooker to cook grains. I mean, I don't even remember last time I used my oven at all. Like I just don't like baking or roasting. I just don't even like using the oven. Um, but so it's really good. You know, you're using a steamer, lightly steam your vegetables because that will also help with the digestion and to be able to break everything down again, if you don't have the digestive enzymes to break down the living foods in the beginning, um, using your rice cooker. And um, yeah, that's kind of what I would recommend for sure. And lastly, we had people ask about, um, there were a, kind of a myriad of questions. I'm going to group them all into one, but a lot of people were very curious about um, the commitment and hours in the kitchen. Like, so there were a lot of questions about, can you eat raw and, you know, and not spend more than like a half an hour per meal in the kitchen? Can it be like this easy conversion or is there a baseline that you just have to accept? And that is, and actually that should have been one of the misconceptions as well, because it actually is a lot quicker to make raw food than it is to cook food. Because when you have to cook food, you have to wait for it to be cooked or you're checking on it, you're stirring it, you're flipping it, you're doing whatever. When you're making raw, there's so much preparation that you can do where you can just make it really quick. Right now, I am so busy that I barely have time to make food for myself. But because it's summer and it's really hot, I'm still managing to eat 100% raw, but I'm barely spending any time in the kitchen. Because for instance, you can prep a lot of your vegetables beforehand. You can wash, chop all your lettuce, store it in the fridge. You can shred a ton of vegetables. You can make a salad dressing or a dip and that will keep three to five days in the fridge in a sealed container. So you just have stuff that's quick grab ready to go. When you dehydrate and make things in the dehydrator, you just make it throw in the dehydrator and you don't even have to like worry about it for the next however many hours until it's done, right? So if I'm making granola or something like that, I just put it in the dehydrator. I might have to flip it once over and then it's done. And then I have a whole bag of granola I can use for the next whatever few weeks. Um, yeah, so it's definitely not, in the beginning, obviously with anything new, you're gonna think that it's more time consuming because you're learning, but that's with anything, not just food. So just like be patient with yourself. And the more you do it, the quicker it's going to be. And it just, it honestly doesn't take that much time at all. Absolutely. I, that, that's music to my ears. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or raw. I love it. And I love the raw restaurants because I think they kind of open you up to what you can do. You know, sometimes you're brain can kind of swim. And it sounds like your course does that for people as well. Well, Crystal, we are out of time today, but I wanted to say thank you so much for coming on and giving us all of your information and um, just taking the time to kind of glean your expertise from what you're doing. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you having me and uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. 
Absolutely. For everyone listening, we have been speaking with Crystal Bonnet. She is an international raw food chef, instructor, and author. You can find out more about everything uh, regarding her books, her course online, as well as her background information, information about recipes and food, the raw kingdom in general, at her website, www.crystaldawnculinary.com. Thank you so much for giving us your time. And until we speak again, remember to stay safe, eat responsibly, and clean when you do. Eat and always bet on yourself. Sunshine.